Welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we explore the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Episode 86 Arcane Magazine's Top 50 Role Playing Games of All Time. This week's topic comes from the habit I have on this show of referring to the poll Arcane Magazine did back in 1996 of its readers to come up with a list of the 50 most popular role-playing games of all time. Seems like I'm noting where the games I'm covering finished on that list on an almost weekly basis, and by now the poll's almost 27 years old. So I figured if I'm going to keep referencing it, maybe we should take a closer look at it and see not only what all is on it, but maybe try to figure out exactly how accurate it is. And to do that, we need to dig a little bit deeper into how popular of a magazine Arcane was. With that said, let's crank up the tour bus and get to today's topic. We can't dive into the list without first doing a little background on Arcane Magazine. Much like last week's episode, I wasn't able to use several of my usual sources for information, so I had to dig onto message boards and other sites that I'm not as confident about their information to get enough details to flesh out the show. I'm just laying that out there up front since I'm well aware I might be dropping some inaccurate knowledge on you today. Arcane Magazine was a UK-published game magazine from Future Publishing that ran from December of 1995 to June of 1997. While it didn't run for a long time, it certainly changed the face of the gaming community while it existed. I can't tell you the number of posts I saw online from readers who praised Arcane for being the magazine it was, which for many meant the ability to get articles on a variety of different role-playing games available on the market. See, by the time Arcane came into existence, White Dwarf had basically been converted into an in-shop advertisement magazine for Games Workshop. Now, that would change in later years, but with one of the most popular magazines at the time going away from non-GW materials, there was a hole created in the game magazine world. That hole was widened a bit later by TSR pulling Dragon Magazine out of the non-TSR game field, which again reduced the number of publications out there covering a variety of different games and companies. And we have to acknowledge that while the internet did exist, it was nowhere near as huge and or prevalent as it is now, and the majority of those using it were on different message boards, sharing their own homebrewed materials or whatever gaming news they'd picked up along the way. I would note for the record that a number of writers for various game magazines used this particular format to gauge interest in articles that would later be published in their own magazines. In other words, if you wanted the juicy stuff, you had to pony up for it. How little things have changed. Reviews from readers at the time marveled at the excellence of Arcane. Readers couldn't get their hands on the magazine fast enough, and for the first year, the sales were quite excellent. So why did it go away so quickly? Well, the truth just goes back to the concept of good old-fashioned business. I mentioned Future Publishing a moment ago, and they were a rather large media company with a variety of publications, including multiple magazines covering video and computer games. Ultimately, they decided that even though Arcane was selling well, when compared to the other magazines in their portfolio, it just wasn't keeping up. So they shut it down and went back to focusing on their other businesses. In the intervening years, a number of hardcore readers of Arcane have changed their thoughts about the magazine. While they loved it at the time, when they go back and look at them again, many thought that they didn't put the same kind of love and effort into role-playing games that they did into video games. Now, that may be a subjective thought, but when I went online and checked out a couple of issues of Arcane and a couple of issues of the different video game magazines, Arcane did do a pretty good job of discussing games. However, the video game magazines were, in my opinion anyway, better. That being said, I think a lot of that comes from the fact that those magazines had been in print for quite some time and Arcane was still trying to find its footing when it was ultimately canceled. But that's just my opinion, and we all know what they say about opinions. The big question that comes from this is why a poll conducted by a magazine that was only in print for a year and a half is utilized by so many sources in the game world? The answer to that lies partially in the fact that Arcane was considered to be a fairly independent source on games and gaming. I mean, it wasn't beholden to a particular publisher like White Dwarf and Dragon Magazines were. That means if they chose to do a poll, chances are it would be about as fair a poll as you were going to find. Now, there is a downside to that, as you might guess. Since Arcane was published in the UK, the majority of the folks participating in the poll would have been European, probably, and not American. 
Now that would be because of the time needed, even in the late 90s, to get foreign materials shipped into the country. I'm not saying that no Americans participated in the poll, because I've got a lot of evidence to the contrary. But I think if the poll had been conducted by an American magazine, we might have seen a different looking list. Now, I'll also admit that after taking all of that into account, this is a fairly impressive looking list they put together. And before we break it down, I do need to remind you that it only consists of games published before the poll was released in December of 1996. So a lot of the games many of you might play and love but were released after that will not be on this list. I'll also try to provide some information on the games I haven't yet covered on the show, though I'm not going to go quite as deep as I would if we were doing an entire show dedicated to the game itself, and some of these games will probably be topics for another show, so there's another reason to not drop too much knowledge on them right now. I'm not going to ignore the games we've already covered, but it's going to be a few words about the game, then a shameless plug for the episode we covered the game in. I mean, i got to drive traffic to the archives somehow, right? Also, I'm only going to name the first company that released the game in cases where multiple publishers are responsible for versions. Otherwise, in some cases, we'd be here all day going over the list. So we'll start with number 50 and work our way down to number one. Here we go. Number 50 on the poll was 2300 AD. 2300 AD was a science fiction role-playing game originally developed by Games Designers Workshop. And I know we covered at least the basics of it back in our episode on GDW, which was episode 67 back in September. At the time, reviews were split on the game, with some reviewers praising its take on the science fiction genre, while others arguing that there were multiple games in the genre that were better than 2300 AD. At 49 was Mech Warrior. Based on the popular video game series Battletech, Mech Warrior was originally released by FASA Corporation in 1986. Again, we touched on Mech Warrior in some detail during our episode on FASA, which was episode 61 back in July of last year. Reviewers tended to love the game, especially since it not only allowed for running a role-playing game in the Battletech universe, but also provided extensive background on that universe, which allowed for a more detailed gaming experience. Number 48 belonged to Dragon Warriors. Dragon Warriors was published by Corgi Books between 1985 and 1986. I say it that way because the game is actually a six book series, with the first book being the basic rules and each of the other five providing adventures and rules that expanded upon the basic rules from the first book. It's been noted that there was a reprint of these books in 2009, but the originals are highly sought after collectibles. Dragon Warriors is noteworthy on this list to me because it's one of the few games I've seen rated to this point where Paul Pettengale's comments on the book weren't 100% glowing, and I'll quote him here for context. Quote, Unfortunately, even though this is a fine, solid system, the format makes it tricky to use and play. Still, it was well received throughout its short life and is highly collectible these days. End quote. Look for us to cover Dragon Warriors in greater detail in a future episode of the podcast. Fighting Fantasy claimed the number 47 spot on the countdown. Published by Puffin Books beginning in 1982, it was the brainchild of Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson. The series consisted of choose-your-own-adventure books, and we covered those in August of last year in episode 64, which covered solo play games. Another game we've covered on the show, at least briefly in the past, is the number 46 entry on the list, James Bond 007. Published between 1983 and 1987, it was designed by Gerard Christopher King and was released by Victory Games, which was an imprint of Avalon Hill. We detailed both the game and Avalon Hill way back in episode 6, which dropped in July of 2021. For those checking the archive, we also detailed Judges Guild, just so you know. Castle Falkenstein drew the number 45 spot in the poll. Developed by Mike Pondsmith and released in 1994 by R. Talsorian Games, it's one of the newer, at the time, games to make the poll. Castle Falkenstein is a steampunk-flavored fantasy game. It was a darling of the critics of the time, though Paul Pettengale noted in his evaluation that it was, quote, either loved or hated by players, end quote. We haven't covered this game or our Talsorian games in an episode yet, so keep your eyes open for us to do so in the near future. At number 44, it's Cyberspace. Originally published in 1989, it was created by Todd Foley and released by Iron Crown Enterprises, these are two more topics we've yet to cover on the show, so let's do a quick briefing on the game itself. It's a cyberpunk game running along the lines of Shadowrun. 
Most of the classes available will be recognizable by players of the latter game, but it's the setting that's different. It takes place in San Francisco in 2090 and plays heavily around the concept of extensive urban sprawl. The 43rd spot on the list was taken by Dark Conspiracy. Designed by Lester Smith and released by Game Designers Workshop in 1991, we didn't cover this game in the GDW episode. It's a near-future horror game, and while that sounds like a great idea on the surface, there were several reviewers who referred to the game's horror elements as unfocused or campy. However, Paul Pettengale's comments in the poll give the overall feelings of much of the gaming world concerning the game itself. Quote, Players take on the roles of people who have learnt of the evil forces at work in the world and are struggling to defeat them. The evil forces have infiltrated what remains of the government and powerful corporations. A great blend of cyberpunk, Call of Cthulhu, and conspiracy paranoia. End quote. Next up on the list is the number 42 entry, Don't Look Back. Designed by Chuck McGrew and published by Mind Ventures in 1994, DLB is a supernatural and horror game, with mixing the two in gameplay being more in the hands of the GM than the creators. The characters are folks working for a secret government agency, investigating supernatural and paranormal events, so the game overall plays like a role-playing game version of The X-Files. Reviews of the first edition ranged from calling it sophomoric to clunky, though later versions of the game have earned stellar reviews. Number 41 on the list belongs to Golden Heroes. Designed by Simon Burley and Peter Haynes, it was originally self-published, which is to say they photocopied the rules and sold them at game shops and conventions on their own. Games Workshop got the license in 1984 and released a more professional and more complete version. It's a superhero game, and while we did two episodes on the genre back in March of last year, we didn't cover this one. The reason why is that even though it was an exceptionally popular game at the time, it's long out of print, and most of the gamers that played Golden Heroes have since switched to newer, and in most opinions, better superhero games. No need to dig into a lot of detail here, as Golden Heroes didn't break much new ground in the genre. Clocking in at number 40 is Heroes Unlimited. Designed by Kevin Ciambiera, Carmen Belair, Wayne Bro Jr., Bill Coffin, Kevin Long, and the proverbial cast of dozens, it was released by Palladium Books in 1984. While we covered Palladium Books back in episode 61, which we mentioned a moment ago when we discussed FASA, I don't believe we touched on Heroes Unlimited at the time. Another game in the superhero genre, its claim to fame was that it was marketed as more of a thinking players kind of game, stressing problem solving over beating the crap out of the bad guys. Reviews for the game were stellar, and this is a game you can still buy today, though we're on a much later version. We break into the 30s with HOL, which ranked 39th in the poll. HOL, designed by Todd Shaughnessy, Daniel Thrawn, and Chris Elliott, was released in 1994 by Black Dog Game Factory. HOL is another science fiction game set in the near future and is another game where humans have colonized areas other than whatever the Earth analog is. In HOL, Earth is called the Human Occupied Landfill, which is where the HOL comes from. Humans have colonized the entire galaxy, and the overall concept of the game is almost literally kill or be killed. This is definitely a game we'll be covering in long form in a future episode. Next up on our countdown. <laughs> You know, I'm feeling a lot like Casey Kasem this week. Um, if you don't know who he is, well, God, I mean, Wikipedia has his name and then you can YouTube some stuff on him. And quite frankly, if you don't know who he is, that's making me feel a hell of a lot older than I am. So thanks for that. Anyway, back to the countdown. Next up is Top Secret SI, which was ranked at 38. Now, I have to note that Top Secret SI is the third version of what was originally called Top Secret. Top Secret SI was designed by Douglas Niles and released by TSR in 1987. We gave it a mention during the TSR episode back in episode 3, which goes all the way back to June of 2021, but we didn't get into much detail on any of the games during that show. Top Secret SI is designed to be an espionage game, where the GM is encouraged to develop their own scenarios to run their players through. TSR supported the game to the hilt at the time, but it was eventually allowed to go out of print. Critics typically compared it to James Bond 007, and while many of them found Bond to be a superior game, mostly due to the non-combat situations, overall Top Secret SI was judged to be a better designed game overall. 
The next two games on the poll are games we've covered both during our timeline episodes at the beginning of this podcast and also in covering their publishing companies. Ghostbusters came in at 37. Based on the exceptionally awesome movie, it was designed by Sandy Peterson, Lynn Willis, and Greg Stafford, and was released by West End Games in 1986, two years after the movie came out. The game follows the same premise as the movie, which places the players in the position of paranormal investigators slash Ghostbusters. Number 36 is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Other Strangeness. Designed by Eric Wuchik and published by Palladium Books, the initial release was in 1985. It was based not on the movies or cartoons, but rather on the comic books, which had been released well before either of those other two came out. The eventual end of the game, as tends to happen in these cases, came when Palladium lost the license. At 35, we come to Twilight 2000. And before some of our younger listeners get too excited, no, this isn't based on those movies. Remember, the poll is 1996 and older games. Designed by Frank Chadwick, Dave Nielsen, Lauren K. Wiseman, and Lester W. Smith, it was released by Games Designers Workshop in 1984. Another post-apocalyptic game, Twilight 2000 picks up after World War III, which included nuclear strikes from the NATO-US side and the Soviet Warsaw Pact side of the war. The players have to pick up the pieces and get on with living, though there are still battles to be fought. One note I wanted to add here is that the system for Twilight 2000 was slightly adjusted by GDW and used for 2300 AD, which we covered earlier in the countdown. Number 34 on the poll belongs to Dream Park. Designed by Mike Poundsmith and released by R. Talsorian Games, Dream Park is based on the 1981 novel Dream Park, which was written by Larry Niven and Stephen Barnes. The premise is that the players are investigating a murder that took place during a LARP in a holographic amusement park. Oh yeah, and the whole thing's being televised. Critics noted that while it was a fun game to run for a couple of sessions or so, they really couldn't imagine trying to run an entire campaign with Dream Park. Still, though, the reviews were quite positive. Werewolf the Apocalypse checks in at number 33 on the poll. We did three episodes on the various titles in the World of Darkness line, and Werewolf was covered in the first of these, which was number 55 in June of last year. Created by Mark Ryan Hagen and published by White Wolf, it was released in 1992. It is, as we've discussed, a horror-based game with the players playing were-creatures of some type. Check out the episodes on the World of Darkness if you want to dive deeper into the game. Tunnels and Trolls is in the 32nd position on the list. We covered this one by request in episode 60, which aired in July of 2022. Designed by Ken St. Andre, it was released by Flying Buffalo Games in 1975. There might be some listeners surprised that Tunnels and Trolls placed as high on the list as it did, but I'd note that at the time of the poll, Tunnels and Trolls was still loved and played worldwide, which, if we're being honest, is still the case today, though maybe by not quite as many people as it was at the time. Tunnels and Trolls is a D&D derivative created because Ken St. Andre wanted a fantasy role-playing game but disliked a D&D. Paul Pettengale noted that the game most likely made the list out of, quote, nostalgia, end quote, because he found it to be, quote, pretty crude, end quote. Ouch. Number 31 goes to Millennium's End. There have been multiple versions of this game published over the years by a number of different companies, but as you'll remember from the start of the show, I'm listing the original versions, as I'm pretty certain these are the ones that were voted onto the poll. That puts me into a bit of a quandary here, since the only information I could dig up on the first version of the game is that it's a techno-thriller set in 1999, and that it was released in 1991 by Chameleon Eclectic Games. So we'll have to use Paul Pettengale's review on the poll to give us an idea of the game. Quote, Millennium's End struggles hard to cut the right balance between fiction and reality, and just manages it. The game system is detailed, but this allows it to model the style of fiction it's based on with more accuracy. Players carry out investigations, espionage, and paramilitary operations, all of which are ably supported. End quote. This is one of those cases where I'll ask that if you know anything more about this game, hit me up on the socials. I'd love to share your knowledge and experiences with our listeners. And of course, I will give you full credit for whatever you share. Rounding out the 30s, we come to Sky Realms of Jorun, which came in at number 30. Designed by Andrew Lecker, his sister Amy, and Miles Tevers, it was published by Sky Realms Publishing which was formed by Andrew and Miles to take what was originally their high school English assignment and turn it into a role-playing game. 
They released the game in 1984, and it's a science fantasy game set in a world of their own creation. The sky realms of the game are floating islands on which generations of space travelers have settled. It was influenced by multiple sources, and reviewers of the game were pretty keen on it, though they noted on more than one occasion that the rules were rather disjointed and confusing, and also noted that anyone running the game was going to need a decent amount of experience doing so before taking this game on. At number 29 is a game we just covered a couple of weeks ago, Aftermath. <laughs> Created by Paul Hume and Robert N. Charette, it was released by Fantasy Games Unlimited in 1981. It's a post-apocalyptic game where characters are basically fighting for all the things they need in order to survive. Again, we just covered this in a semi-long form a couple of weeks ago. You should check out episode 83 for all the details. Number 28 brings us Over the Edge. Designed by Robin Laws and Jonathan Tweet, it was released by Atlas Games in 1992. It's set on the island of Al Armaja and is full of secrets and conspiracies, which makes it similar to Vampire the Masquerade in many ways. And that would make sense since these two worked on that game as well. Over the Edge has the distinction of being the first game to bring the dice pool into gaming, and we've seen that used a hundred times at least since then. Reviewers praised the game for its originality, and it proved popular enough to produce multiple editions over the years. Champions checks in next on our list at 27. Designed by Steve Peterson, George McDonald, Bruce Harlech, and Ray Greer, it was released by Hero Games in 1981. Now, I know we covered this at least briefly in one of the two superhero episodes we released in March of last year, but let's hit a couple of basics just to be fair. It's based on the hero system, which is also known as the champion system, and we've discussed this briefly in several other episodes of the show as well. As you might have guessed, it's a superhero game, but what makes it different from others is that characters' abilities are defined by their effects, which makes it a bit more realistic, or at least gives a feel to the character that better equals what you'd see in a comic book or movie. Reviewers tended to have nice things to say about it, but the average rating for champions checks in at three stars out of five. At 26, we get Palladium Fantasy Role-Playing Game. Developed by Kevin Ciambietta and most of the development crew at Palladium Books, it was released in 1983. It's Palladium's take on D&D and the D&D world, and since we did an episode breaking this down in detail, I'll leave that episode to speak for the game. For the record, that's episode 69 from September of last year, and we also covered the storytelling system in that show. Number 25 brings us Stormbringer. Created by Ken St. Andre, Lynn Willis, and the proverbial cast of dozens, it was released by Chaosium in 1981. It's a fantasy game, as you might expect from the title, and is based on the Elric novels from Michael Moorcock. Pretty much every review I found for the game was a positive one, with the reviewer stating that if you're a fan of Elric, you should definitely play the game. After all, the title for the game comes from the name of Elric's sword. Fun fact. Earth Dawn is the number 24 game on our list. Designed by Greg Gordon, it was published by FASA in 1993. It, like many of the games on this list, is a fantasy game, but the twist on it is that it acknowledges that all things occurring in nature go through cycles, and magic is one of those things. When magic is high in the world, horrors can cross over into the world. This is where the characters come in, as it's their job to deal with them. Reviewers tended to like the layout of the book, but one reviewer in particular called it, quote, more frosting than cake, end quote. So we're one game past the halfway point. I can tell you with great certainty that this is going to be a long show. Normally when this happens, I split the episode into two pieces. This time, though, I'm not going to do that because we've gone way short the past month or so, and I feel like I kind of owe it to you to give you a longer episode. I guess it's time for me to shut up and get back to it. Number 23 on the list goes to Conspiracy X. This is probably the newest game to make the list as it was released in 1996 by New Millennium Entertainment. It was created by Dave Chapman and George Valsikos and has been described by more than one reviewer as an almost dead-on analog for the X-Files. Needless to say, that means the characters are investigating aliens that have come to Earth and are stirring up their own brand of trouble. I think the reason it rated so high on the list were the reviews. Every review I saw was stellar, ranking between 9 and 10 stars on a 10-star scale. Rick Swan even said in the August 1996 issue of Dragon that, quote, it's the latest in the Aliens Walk Among Us genre and also the best, end quote. Riffs earned number 22 in the poll. 
Written by Kevin Ciambietta and his crew at Palladium Books, it was released in 1990. We covered this game in great detail back in episode 63, which dropped in August of last year, so check that out to hear me gush over the game. GURPS was also a part of that show, and I actually think it was the first game we covered that week, just so you know. Number 21 goes to Judge Dredd. Designed by Mark Gascone and Rick Priestley, it was released by Games Workshop in 1985. The game was based on the hugely popular comic series, which, for those of you who don't know, puts the characters in the position of being judges in a future society. Don't think robes and gavels. Think armor, helmets, and guns, because while you're not necessarily the judge, jury, and executioner, sometimes it's entirely possible you will be. Reviews were 9 to 10 stars across the board, and every review I read recommended it highly. We cracked the top 20 with Space 1889. Designed by Frank Chadwick and published by Game Designers Workshop in 1988, this game can be best described as a Victorian-era steampunk space game. Wow. I realize that's a mouthful, but the basic idea is that many of the scientific ideas of the time that were debunked were actually true, and Thomas Edison invented a method to get people into space. From there, we get into the adventures as these Victorian Earthlings explore space. Both serious science fiction and straight-up tongue-in-cheek farce, Space 1889 got average star reviews, though most critics did say it was fun to play. What they didn't like was that the rules were sort of all over the place, requiring players and GMs to either create house rules on the spot or spend a lot of time trying to find what they needed. Number 19 on the poll goes to Ars Magica. Designed by Mark Ryan Hagen and Jonathan Tweet, it was released by Lion Rampant Games in 1987. It's set in what's called Mythic Egypt, and if you want to know more about it, we devoted an entire episode to it. That was episode 48 from April of last year. Number 18 on the list is a game that in all my research for this show, I'd never heard of before. Feng Shui. It's designed by Robin Laws, who has a number of games on this poll, and was released by Daedalus Entertainment in 1996. Another game that came out just before the poll was released, Feng Shui earned its spot by being a martial arts game in the style of Hong Kong action movies. Feng Shui plays into the rules because those who have a lot of Feng Shui are considered powerful. The more powerful you are, the more you control. Reviewers across the board praised Feng Shui for taking on the genre, but not falling into the tropes that could have made the game a parody. That being said, though, they also admitted that having some moments of fun and or comedy were possible when appropriate. Bushido comes in at number 17 on the poll. Designed by Robert N. Charette and Paul R. Hume, it was released by Tier Games in 1979. It's a samurai-flavored game based in feudal Japan. For more on the rules and the system, check out the episode on Fantasy Games Unlimited from just a few weeks ago, as we broke the game down in detail on that show. Number 16 goes to another game we've done a full breakdown for on the show, Mage the Ascension. Designed by the team of Stuart Week, Christopher Early, Stephen Week, Bill Bridges, Sam Chupp, and Andrew Greenberg, it was released by White Wolf Publishing in 1993. Another fine game in the world of Darkness Line, mage characters use magic to shape reality. Again, we covered this in great detail during the three episodes we did on the various titles in the world of Darkness and Chronicles of Darkness, so check those out for more details. Rollmaster checks into our poll at number 15. Created by Coleman Charlton, John Curtis, Pete Fenlon, and Steve Marvin, it was released by Iron Crown Enterprises in 1980. It's a fantasy role-playing game, but beyond that, it's almost a full-on system of its own. Over the years, around 50 different books and supplements have been published for the games, and reviewers have found it to be a complex system, but in a good way. Across the board, the game was recommended, though with the warning that you'd better be on your A-game if you were going to run it or play it. GURPS picked up the 14th spot on our poll. Designed by Steve Jackson and published by Steve Jackson Games in 1985, GURPS isn't so much a game as it is an entire game system, as the rules provided can be used for whatever genre of game you want to play. We expanded on GURPS back in episode 63 in August of last year. We head back to the World of Darkness for the 13th game on our list, Wraith the Oblivion. Created by Mark Ryan Hagen, Sam Chupp, and Jennifer Hartshone, it was published by White Wolf Publishing in 1994. Now, Wraith is darker than most of the other games in the line, as it covers a very dark afterlife for the characters playing. 
This one was also covered in long form during the three episodes on the World of Darkness games, so check them out for more details. By the way, as we move higher and higher up this list, you'll notice we're running into more and more games that we've already covered on the show. However, there's going to be one on here that's going to shock you, and that's because somehow we haven't covered it in long form yet. Getting back to the poll, Pendragon is number 12. Designed by Greg Stafford and published by Chaosium in 1985, Pendragon is the ultimate medieval game of chivalry and Arthurian legend I've seen yet. And is it obvious I really dig this game? We covered it as about as extensively as possible way back in December of 2021 in episode 31, and you can hear me fanboy over it if you check out that show. Number 11 on the countdown goes to Middle Earth Roleplaying. Designed by Coleman Charlton and published by Iron Crown Enterprises in 1985, it's based on, you guessed it, Lord of the Rings. I don't think that requires much more of an explanation than that, but we did try to back in December of 2021 when we covered games based on literature, so you can check out that episode and see how we did. It's time to get into the top 10, and we begin with Cyberpunk. Designed by Mike Poundsmith and published by R. Talsorian Games in 1988, Cyberpunk can be best described as a dystopian science fiction game. Pondsmith has stated he was influenced by Blade Runner, and it shows in the finished product. We covered Cyberpunk in great detail back in episode 60, which came out in July of last year, so check that out for a deeper explanation of the game. Number 9 goes to Star Wars D6. Now, the actual name of the game was Star Wars the Role-Playing Game, but since there have been several other Star Wars games released since then, the source I used for the poll used the D6 designation so as not to confuse folks. Designed by Greg Kostikian and released by West End Games in 1987, this version of the game not only provided role players with their first opportunity to play in the actual Star Wars universe, but it also influenced Timothy Zahn when he wrote novels to expand the universe back in the 90s. We've touched on the game twice, and we did it in back-to-back -back episodes. Episode 23 covered all of the Star Wars games, along with Star Trek, and came out the last week of October in 2021, while episode 24 covered West End Games and Greg Kostikian specifically. Check out both of these shows for more details on this particular game. At number 8, we get Shadowrun. Look, in my opinion, this is the best cyberpunk game out there, but I know there are those who will disagree with me to the point of near violence. It's my opinion, and we know what they say about opinions. It was designed by a huge team, which included Robert N. Charette, Paul Hume, Tom Dowd, L. Ross Babcock III, Sam Lewis, Dave Wiley, and Mike Mulville, among others. It was released by FASA in 1989. Look, I could fanboy this game more here, but since I did an entire episode on it back in August of 2021, why not check that out? For those keeping score at home, it's episode 22. The hits that landed in the top 10 just keep on coming as Paranoia landed at number 7. Designed by Greg Kostikian, Dan Gelber, Eric Goldberg, and Alan Varney, it was released by West End Games in 1984. A dystopian future game, Paranoia took itself in a totally different direction with the opportunity for serious comedy as well as serious total party kills always being in play. As I've said multiple times in the past few minutes, and we'll be saying several more times before the show ends, we did an entire episode on this game, and it's number 25 from November of 2021. Landing just outside the top five is Vampire the Masquerade. The originator of the World of Darkness, it was designed by Mark Ryan Hagen, Graham Davis, Tom Dowd, Lisa Stevens, and Stuart Week. White Wolf Publishing handled the release, and it first published in 1991. Not only did Vampire launch the World of Darkness, it also brought the storytelling system into the tabletop role-playing world. Vampire was covered in the first of the three episodes we did on the World of Darkness, and the storytelling system got an episode of its own as well. That's episode 69 from September of last year. Okay, so if Vampire, Shadowrun, Star Wars, and Paranoia didn't make the top five, which games did? I'm sure you've already guessed at least one of them, but I think there's a couple here you didn't guess. Number five goes to RuneQuest. Designed by Steve Perrin, Ray Tunney, Steve Henderson, Warren James, and basing the entire location on the design of Greg Stafford, Chaosium handled the publishing, releasing the game in 1978. RuneQuest is most definitely a fantasy role-playing game, and characters in its world are divided into those who cast magic and those who don't. Look, we've got this slated for its own episode coming up, so I, I don't want to spoil it. 
Let's just say one of the features of RuneQuest is the setting that Stafford designed, which is way better detailed than some of the settings designed by Wizards of the Coast over the past decade or so. Yeah, yeah, I know, that really wouldn't take much, but this is really, really good. Number four on the list kind of surprised me, but in a good way. Warhammer Fantasy Roleplaying took this spot. Designed by Richard Hallowell, Rick Priestley, Graham Davis, Jim Bambra, and Phil Gallagher, it was released by Games Workshop in 1986. It was designed to be a companion piece to the Warhammer miniature wargaming system Games Workshop already owned and developed. The role-playing game took on a life of its own and obviously became popular enough in a 10-year span to jump past a lot of really good games and nail down this spot in the poll. If you want to know how that's possible, check out episode 40 from February of last year. We gave WFRP an entire episode to prove why we think it's a damn good game. Number three on the list goes to Traveler, one of the oldest games on this list. It was released in 1977 by Games Designers Workshop and was designed by Mark Miller, Frank Chadwick, John Harshman, and Lauren Wisen. It's a science fiction exploration game with characters exploring space, getting into space battles, negotiating with aliens, and all the types of adventures you'd expect from the genre. Difference is, Traveler did it better than anyone else, in my opinion. And obviously, it was the opinion of a hell of a lot of other folks here as well. We hit on Traveler during the first two timeline episodes of the show, which are episodes four and five from June of 2021. And we touched on it in the GDW episode, which is number 67 from September of last year. All right, two spots left. Number two goes to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I know, right? Credited to Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, the first edition of AD&D dropped in 1977. Look, I don't think we need to say much else about the game here since we've covered it multiple times during the show. On top of that, I'd say it's safe to assume that the large majority of you know AD&D quite well. For those who don't, episodes 2 and 3 from June of 2021, episodes 12 and 13 from August of 2021, and episode 26 from November of 2021 all cover this edition in some form, with episode 26 being the AD&D first edition deep dive. So if AD&D wasn't number one, who in the hell was? This is the game I'm embarrassed to say I haven't covered in long form yet on the podcast. At number one... It's Call of Cthulhu. Designed by Sandy Peterson and published by Chaosium, Call of Cthulhu was released in 1981. Based on the Cthulhu mythos created by H.P. Lovecraft, Call of Cthulhu is considered by pretty much every gamer out there to be the horror game of horror games. And if it isn't, it's probably because they've never played it before. I covered the game a little bit back in episode 5, which was a timeline episode, but we'll need a full episode to really break down what makes Cthulhu special. I mean, the chance of going completely mad at pretty much any point in the game is a pretty good starting point. But there's so much more to it. It really does deserve an episode of its own. And that's the list. Those are the 50 games considered to be the best games of all time as of 1996. For those who were gaming at the time, do you agree with this list? Are there games you would have put on the list that didn't make it? And would you change the order? I can tell you this. Over the past couple of decades, there have been a lot of discussion and argument over the order of the top 10 especially where it concerns the positioning of AD&D and Cthulhu. But that's an argument for another time. Why? Because we've come to the end of today's tour. Special thanks go out this week to the various internet posters who've kept the Arcane Magazine poll alive for all of us to see. Their postings are filled with commentary as well as the poll, so be ready for a long read if you go to check them out. Next week, I write the wrong I just admitted to and cover Call of Cthulhu in long form. In the meanwhile, I'd ask you to check out our other podcast, Bad GM's Campaign Build-Along. This week, we're building the third of three jobs on our group's job board, and if time permits, we'll start laying out the groundwork for the group to get revenge retribution to try to right a wrong that they found about in the last episode. Bad GM's Campaign Build-Along is available wherever you get your podcasts or from our website, badgmproductions.net. The music we use for this show comes from Pixabay.com. Check them out for all your royalty-free, license-free music needs. Role Playing History is a production of Bad GM Productions. Check us out on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash gaming forward slash Bad GM Prod. On Twitter at Bad GMP. YouTube and Tumblr, Bad GM Productions. You can email us, badgmproductions at gmail.com. And our website, again, is badgmproductions.net. 
I'd encourage you to check out our Facebook page, YouTube channel, and website as we've been posting exclusive videos to all three over the past few weeks. Some of the videos expand on topics we've covered on the podcasts, but some of our stuff is brand new and exclusive to the site it's posted on. And if you've got requests for video topics, hit us up, and if we can make it happen, you know we will. Next week, we step into the Lovecraftian world of Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> Get ready to lose your frickin' mind. But that's next week. Until then, I'm Wayne Davis, and you're Role Playing History.